This section of notes is over plant life cycles and forms of reproduction. The basic plant life cycle is called alternation of generations and consists of a haploid phase, which is 1N, and a diploid phase, which is 2N. The haploid phase is called the gametophyte phase, and the diploid phase is called the sporophyte phase, and it alternates between the two. This can be really confusing because humans, our only haploid cell is the gamete, so sperm and egg, but plants actually can live in a haploid stage, in a 1N stage. And so that's what's kind of confusing about this. The spore-producing plant is the mature sporophyte. The sporophyte phase is diploid and it begins with a fertilized egg. For me, the best thing to do when I'm looking at this picture is to always find where fertilization occurs and then I can kind of work my way from there. Spores are produced through meiosis and because it's meiosis, we're going to reduce the number at that point. Because remember, mitosis, we're going to keep it two in, but meiosis, we're going to reduce the number of chromosomes to one in. And that's what's going to happen right here. The gamete producing plant is known as a mature gametophyte. And the gametophyte phase is haploid. And again, if you can kind of start from, you know, fertilization and then go over towards meiosis, you see the spores are haploid. They're going to grow into this gametophyte, which is going to produce gametes, which are still haploid. So it begins with the spores, and it ends with gametes. Now, gametes are produced through mitosis, but mitosis keeps the number the same. So we start with 1N haploid, and we end with 1N haploid. When fertilization occurs, that's when we can increase the number from 1N to 2N, and the process starts all over. In ferns and other seedless vascular plants, the spores are produced by spore-producing sacs on the underside of each leaf. That's what these things are right here in this picture. And these spores develop into the gametophyte. It still needs freestanding water because remember it's seedless, so it needs that water to allow sperm to swim towards egg. In these pictures of the ferns, you can see that the sporophyte is the dominant phase. That's what it's gonna live most of its life in. And then the gametophyte is the other phase. In gymnosperms, which are the cone-bearing plants that are a little more advanced, there are male and female cones, and they develop spores through meiosis. The male spores develop into pollen grains, and the female spores develop into the female gametophyte, which produces eggs. The male cones release their pollen, which you can see right here. This picture honestly freaks me out because it makes me think of cedar fever and all that pollen that so many of us in Texas are so allergic to. But this pollen gets released and then it fertilizes the female egg inside the female cones and that's what's going to develop into an actual seed. So pollination is going to occur when sperm from a pollen grain meets an egg in an ovule, which is what we're going to see right here. Before we talk about reproduction and flowering plants, we need to go through the parts of the flower. The flower is the reproductive organ of a flowering plant, and all the parts are pretty important. The first two parts we're going to talk about are the sepals and the petals, which sometimes can be confused. So sepals are the outermost layer that protects a developing flower. So if you think about a flower bud before it has bloomed, that outer layer is the sepals. Sometimes they are green and tiny like this picture. Other times they look like the actual petals. It really just depends on the flower we're looking at. The petals though, are more on the inside and their job is to help attract animal pollinators. That is why they are colorful. Now we're gonna talk about the male structure of the flower. It is the stamen, which is this whole thing right here, this tube right here, as well as this orange part at the top. The two parts of it are the filament, which really just holds up the um, anther. And the anther is at the top and it's the part that's going to produce pollen grains. Often with a lot of flowers, if you touch this anther, all that pollen will brush off on your finger because its job is really to spread easily. 
It's important to note that there are several stamens per flower because there's always more of a need for the male gametes than the female gametes, especially because pollen really is going to go randomly through the air or be carried by a pollinator, and so you can't really guarantee where it lands, and so there needs to be more available, which is why there are more stamen. The female reproductive part of a flower is known as the carpal. You will also see it called the pistil sometimes, but we're going to refer to it as the carpal. It's the innermost layer of the flower, and there's just going to be one of them, and it has three parts. It has a stigma at the top, and I like to call it the sticky stigma because that helps me remember what it's called. It's the sticky tip of the carpal, and it's sticky because it needs to get the pollen that is spread by pollinators or by the wind. The next part is the style, and this is the tube leading from the sticky stigma to the ovary. So that means this is the ovary, which produces the female gametophyte. In the ovary, you also have ovules, which will develop into eggs. The male gametophyte, or the pollen grain, is produced in the anthers. Male spores divides by mitosis to produce a pollen grain of two haploid cells, and a thick wall surrounds the cell. So there are actually two haploid cells in here, and then we have our thick protective wall. One female gametophyte can form in each ovule of a flower's ovary. So one of the cells in the ovary will then develop into an egg. Pollination occurs when a pollen gram lands on a stigma, and it's actually really cool how this happens. So remember that pollen grain has two cells in it. One of the cells is actually going to create a pollen tube. So it's going to land on the stigma and a pollen tube is going to be created that goes all the way down to the ovule. The second cell is going to divide into two sperm. It's always only two sperm, which is really interesting. And those two sperm will travel down the pollen tube to the ovule where they can fertilize the egg. After fertilization, each ovule becomes a seed. While the seed develops, the surrounding ovary grows into a fruit. And so a fruit is, the, is actually the mature ovary of a flowering plant. Fruit, of course, is very important to spreading the seeds because an animal can eat the fruit, digest the seeds, that seed coat will protect the seeds, and so the seed will be passed through the animal's digestive system, and then when the animal travels and goes to the restroom somewhere, now those seeds have spread to a new location. In fact, there are some seeds that won't germinate until they've gone through the digestive tract of an animal, which is pretty interesting. Seeds contain the plant embryo, which will develop into the mature plant. And then they have another section called an endosperm. The endosperm provides a food supply for the embryo. And then the seed coat is going to protect the whole plant embryo. So we have our plant embryo right here. This is what's going to actually sprout into the plant. And then this endosperm, which kind of provides it food initially. Because when it starts to sprout, it doesn't have any sunlight. It can't do photosynthesis yet. So it needs that food, that sugar, to provide it energy to grow. And that's the job of the endosperm. And then the seed coat is just going to protect it. Seeds can actually stay dormant for a long, long time. In fact, there is a seed bank that its job is to hold all these seeds from all over the world in case there was ever a disaster that destroyed a ton of plants. We have this source of seeds that we can use to um, recreate food. Besides being eaten and spread around, animals can also spread seeds that... Um, cling or stick to them, like this poor puppy with these burrs on his head. The animal would travel a distance and hopefully it would brush off somewhere else and now the seed is at a new location. Seeds also can be adapted to spread by wind. They can have a wing-like or parachute-like fruits on them that get carried by the wind. And seeds can be dispersed by water if they float, like this coconut here. 
Like I said earlier, seed can stay dormant for a long time, but if the environmental conditions are favorable, it'll start to grow. And the main thing that causes a seed to start to grow is moisture. If a seed gets wet, it can start breaking down that seed coat, which will cause it to grow. Germination is the term we use to talk about the beginning of growth of an embryo. The embryo breaks out of its seed coat and begins to grow into what we call a seedling. I like this picture a lot because it shows the seed coat of this bean plant falling off and just laying at the ground next to the plant. So the type of reproduction we just talked about was sexual reproduction because it did involve two parents, an egg and sperm. Asexual reproduction can also occur with some plants, and this occurs when offspring are genetically identical to a single parent, and it allows plants to make copies of itself. This is a characteristic that a lot of succulents can do. So for example, this cactus here, or something like an aloe vera plant, a lot of those can grow, and you can actually just remove part of the plant and plant it somewhere else, and it will continue to grow, but it is a clone of that original plant. Some plants also have structures that are specifically adapted for ve vegetative reproduction, so that asexual reproduction. For example, example, stolons. These are stems that grow horizontally along the ground and produce roots and leaves at certain points, like this strawberry plant here. The stolon goes over here, puts down a new plant because it has its own root system and leaves. Another example are tubers. These are underground stems modified for storage, so like potatoes, and they can produce new plants from buds. So each of these budded areas can actually be cut off and planted and it will grow into a new plant. So like this one right here, we have you know at least two, there might be more back here, that could grow into two individual plants. This is actually a huge key point in the movie and book The Martian where he is able to reproduce these potatoes on Mars because he can make several plants from one potato. Bulbs are an underground stem surrounded by modified leaves. They're adapted for storage, but they can also divide and produce new plants. So this is another form of vegetative reproduction.